Yes, a new animation studio has risen from the ashes of studios past. Ron's Gone Wrong released today, at least if you're in the US. I saw it a week ago, so this will be the most on-trend video I make in a while. Still, with that extra time, I've decided to do a little bit of extra research on this unearthed corner of the animation industry. After all, we're almost a year on from the collapse of a studio we've at least been aware of through the years, Blue Sky Studios. Is this newcomer the leftover lingerers of that team? Or a fresh face? Who are they run by? Or who are they inspired by? Does the lure of basic baby bait for tons of profit drag these newbies down? Or is it secretly the next Pixar, bursting with cinematic potential to be some of the best of the best? Come join me as we unearth the tale that is the newcomer animation studio, Locksmith Animation. And of course, we'll be talking about Ron too. I'll keep things spoiler free for you though. So when I first laid eyes on the trailer for Ron's Gone Wrong, I'll admit to you now, now. I, I don't want you addicted to some device. Yeah, no. Oh, man. I really wasn't impressed. This can easily fall into your classic boomer humor bait of technology bad and kids stupid. And even if it wasn't, god haven't we seen this concept before? This looks like the next generation's version of that same scene from the Mitchells vs the Machines. In fact, there's a lot of Mitchells vs Machines connections in this movie. There's a tech company pulling the stops on this new technology, a generational divide on the impact technology has on the younger generation, and it's all about a rogue AI massively influencing the technology that requires a kind of heist into the main headquarters that's one big architecturally uncommon shape. And more so than just Mitchells vs the Machines, Machines, you can see inspirations from all sorts of sources. I feel like it could do more, it feels like a baby Baymax. As well as, to a smaller scale, the reminiscent designs to Eve from Wally. -E. And as for the humor, it's where I can see him. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I can sense a good chunk of illumination in that. So let's have a look at who's working within this new studio, and the hints of their history to what kind of quality we can expect from them. Locksmith Animation was actually founded in 2014 by two women, Julie Lockhart and Sarah Smith, claiming to be the only high-end computer animation studio in the UK making computer animated family films. Over here we have studios like Armand Animation over in Bristol, but Locksmith is London based. And fun fact, this foundation was also created with the financial backing from Elizabeth Murdoch. A media executive and daughter of Rupert Murdoch, responsible for 21st Century Fox back in those days, as well as the majority of your news outlets. Yay. Anyway, with these two as the highest ups, for Ron's Gone Wrong, they take on the roles of producer for both, as well as writer and director for Sarah Smith, along with their team. Judy Lockhart, previously producing with Ardman Animations on Shaun the Sheep the movie, as well as the Pirates in an Adventure with Scientists and Creature Comforts. This was like an insanely nostalgic TV show in Britain. It synced up people talking talking about their homes with animated animals talking about their living conditions. Wow, what a throwback. And as for Sarah Smith, she was similarly involved with Ardman through Arthur Christmas, in which she also directed, wrote and produced, as well as working on all sorts of TV series in all three roles. So all right, our two leaders are actually excerpts of Ardman rather than Blue Skies. Makes sense considering they started in 2014, but of course there are all sorts of other crew members to keep in mind, but let's talk about Ron again for a mo. While upon first viewing I was quite the cynic, my mood soon changed upon realising that this was in fact a newcomer's burgeoning attempt to join the market. I don't want to be the guy who punches down on the new guy. Instead, I felt it would be best to compare this movie not to the likes of Wally -E or the actual successes of like Despicable Me, but to the first movies that were actually made by each animation studio. I mean, there's some real hit or misses in that selection. Look at this. Sure, you probably all know that Pixar's first movie was Toy Story. Talk about hitting it out of the park. But then there's DreamWorks. Ants. Just hopping on Pixar's coattails. Sony started with Open Season. Warner Brothers Animation's first 3D film was the Lego Movie. Does that really count? And then followed it up with Storks. Bloody Storks. Ardman Animation began with Chicken Run, terrified me as a kid. Blue Skies released Ice Age and never lived it down. Image Movers started with the Polar Express and then Monster House, and then there's the Weinstein Company that opened with Hoodwinked, which I really enjoyed, and Dougal. So really, considering this is a first start, there's all sorts of range of quality as the competition, so I don't want to be all too hard on it. So with all that in mind, how does Ron fare against it all? Actually, it's pretty darn good. I wouldn't say it's a masterpiece a la Toy Story or the Lego Movie. I mean, for the most part, it plays things pretty damn safe. To the point I predicted most of it on the bus ride to the cinema, but even 
And still, something that certainly doesn't go amiss is the fact that it has a lot of heart. It may have many similarities with the whole techno prompt cliche it's playing with, but I liked the different direction it took with that prompt, opting for a more wholesome vibe about building friendship up. One of the bigger highlights for me has to just be the soundtrack of the movie hitting on that kind of emotive Pixar tone in some scenes. Who was the composer, you ask? Oh, only the legendary Henry Jackman, responsible for a seemingly unending list of iconic films. Kingsman, Detective Pikachu, Big Hero 6, there's that connection again, Wreck-It Ralph, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles the movie? Is that real? Anyway, an absolute powerhouse handling the audio side of things certainly doesn't give this movie an unsteady footing for its first entry. And of course, these more emotive scenes couldn't survive on just music alone. We mentioned earlier that Sarah Smith was co-director, as the other one in that chair goes to one Jean-Philippe Vine. Also connected partially to Aardman as the director of Shaun the Sheep TV series and assistant animator on The Curse of the Were-Rabbit, this guy is also notably a Pixar story artist, handling work on Inside Out, The Good Dinosaur, and Cars 3. A Pixar member in the directing chair? That's certainly worth turning some heads. And what I found surprising as I watched the film is how much stuff actually got called back to. Maybe I've just been watching too many terrible films lately, but without spoiling too much, there's all sorts of small elements that crop up early on that do in fact get some sort of payoff, which I really appreciate it. The family of Barney was a bit weird to me for a while, seeming like some Illumination-esque craze fest, and I got a similar vibe on the character designs for some characters like the teacher and the villain. They literally could be in Despicable Me and I wouldn't notice. But the family especially started to grow on me with the exploration of being a widowed father, and helping to ride alongside Sarah Smith was Peter Bainham. A bit of an oddball when it comes to his history, he also is credited as a writer for Arthur Christmas, classically Aardman and Sony, then he's also written the original Hotel Transylvania, and after that, Borat's subsequent movie film. I guess kooky and energetic is just his thing. That being said, I think there could have been more potential with the dad character, especially towards the end, but at the very least, this wasn't just your boomer humour of a movie. Though there were some Illumination level kids jokes. Farts are a thing in this movie, to the point that it becomes a recurring gag at the same fart moment, but it doesn't linger on too long. And there's a good bit of political satire with the villain being a global tech giant exec. Certainly some lines to go over the kids' heads. And if you're enjoying this content so far, let me know by subscribing. I can see the numbers, and I can see if you've hit the bell as well, so do it. <laughs> this is kind of my version of new movie reviews, so let me know your thoughts on it in the comments. Or what do you think of the studio so far? Don't worry, there's still more video to go, but if you want to see more things from me, here are all my links. These ones are my particular favourites. Or if you're going to London Comic Con this weekend, I'll be there too. Wave me down if you see me in the crowd. Back to Ron. As for the visuals, if you haven't seen yourself, yeah, it's pretty nice. I, for some reason, find the ears, like, really satisfying. I don't know why, especially with the lighting and the subsurface scattering, but in general, the movie looks nice. And there were some good bits of cinematography. I saw a dolly zoom, some good silhouetting and compositions and all that. Highlighted more on the emotional moments, of course. In the cinematography department, we have David Pierce and Hayley White coming with a more diverse history in their past. David, for example, was the director of Happy Feet 2 and camera director for the original, as well as director and cinematographer for a documentary short, Rainforest Beneath the Canopy, and he has a history in visual effects with Gods of Egypt, Mad Max Fury Road, the previs anyway, as supervisor, and Inspector Gadget 2. Oh, he just designed the opening title. Interesting. Hayley White, on the other hand, works as a layout artist or lead, starting with Happy Feet 2 and then all the Lego movies rising the ranks. And she also dabbled in visual effects for all sorts of movies. Is that a thing? Cinematographers and visual effects? For her, there's Thor Ragnarok previs lead, Alice Through the Looking Glass, X-Men Apocalypse, and Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Whew, that's quite the range. I will admit though, there's a specific part where I perked up watching this movie, and that was after all the standard introductions, Ron just full on starts assaulting a bully. Then it got interesting. They sort of explore the robotic laws of never causing harm to other humans, but I don't know if they actually fully address it by the end of the film. Ah oh, well, I found it very enjoyable from that point on. 
This film was much better than I expected it to be. Is it riddled with all sorts of cliches? Oh yeah, the awkward protagonist is awfully overdone, but I liked that even their friends address them as like, not, not friends? It's like a weird common ground relationship, which I certainly have experienced in my life, and it's a bit more of a realistic one to see on screen. Plus, the messaging was interesting, showcasing that despite all sorts of interactions with technology and how it looks from the outside, it can still be a lonely experience on the other side. I enjoyed seeing the global tech company vision split into the creative and the corporate and having your main character have asthma was a cool bit of representation and drama as you can probably expect. This film isn't some masterpiece but it's not completely mediocre either. It finds a nice joy inducing middle ground of just being a damn nice start for this new animation company. Is anyone from the crew actually from Blue Sky Studios? Well, last one to really mention is producer Lara Bray, who previously worked on Penguins of Madagascar and Megamind. So, no. While this studio isn't exactly a response to Blue Sky Studios, as some might think, the sources of knowledge from the crew we have seen spread far and wide. I mean, you've heard it already. We've got people from the likes of Aardman, Sony, Pixar, Animal Logic, Warner Bros, Marvel, DreamWorks, and not an Illumination project in sight. What a perfect concoction, right? Whilst this may be a safe play for their first introduction, with this kind of resume, the potential for Locksmith Studios could really be to become something absolutely absolutely great. Except that isn't the end of our story. See, during the early days of the company, there were all sorts of distribution deals going on. In April of 2014, one was agreed where visual effects and animation studio Double Negative would provide animation for their films. These guys do a lot of live action visual effects for things like Marvel and Tenet and Alita Battle Angel, but it never came to be. In May 2016, a deal was made with Paramount Pictures acting as distributor so that films would be under the Paramount Animation label, but one year later the CEO was replaced and the deal was discarded. Then in September 2017, they formed the multi-year production deal with 20th Century Fox distributing now under the 20th Century Fox animation label with the aim to release a film every 12 to 18 months. This is where Ron's Gone Wrong had been arranged, and so it does come under that label. However, it continues. In October of 2019, Disney swallowed 20th Century Animation, and so a whole new multi-year production deal was made with Warner Brothers now, who will distribute future films under the Warner Animation Group label. Since Ron's Gone Wrong was already locked in, fun fact, this will be the only film distributed under the 20th Century label. But while something as small as distributor label shouldn't really impact the future of a film's quality, this next bit just might. In June of 2021, it was announced that the co-writer, co-producer, co-director of Ron's Gone Wrong and co-founder of Locksmith Animation, The Smith, of Locksmith, Sarah Smith decided to leave the company in order to pursue her own creative endeavors. And to fill the gap she left behind? The former COO of Illumination Entertainment, Natalie Fisher. She joined Illumination back in 2012, right before, well, everything that makes Illumination, Illumination. So to have her as the new highest up, doesn't fill me with a lot of confidence, and Sarah leaving for creative endeavors? Is not having your own animation studio enough? Or perhaps it's reflective of the business decisions going forwards, not allowing for the free-flowing creativity Sarah was looking for. Who knows? I certainly can't tell you in a discussion. But I will leave you off with this. The currently in production movies over at Locksmith right now. This is the future to expect. First we've got That Christmas, based on Richard Curtis's children's book series. Then we've got Wed Wabbit, another book adaptation on Lisa Evans' children's book. And then an original musical comedy film. There's definitely room for good and bad here. The books are pretty new, publishing in 2020 and 2017, but they're not original, and the musical comedy can really go either way. It'd be grand not to have some other jukebox musical kids films are cluttered with right now, but there's always a chance James Corden will appear in it again, and it's all downhill from there. Either way, I'll be keeping a close eye on everything Locksmith does. It's exciting to have something start while I'm paying attention, rather than having all this Sony and DreamWorks stuff go over my head when I was dawdling through life in 2017. If we truly had to rank Ron's Gone Wrong against debut movies, I'd say it was better than Monster House and Polar Express, but not quite as good as Chicken Run. Something like this makes sense to me. Tell me your rankings too. 
For now, my name's been Daz, you didn't really care, and I'll see you in a bit.